I don't know if at this point you could tell me and the viewers anything more of um, some of the some of the unique traits or unique history of the wet sewerton, what, whatever feels appropriate for now, you know, not no pressure, um, or 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 even perhaps some of the unique traits or history of the Gidimten, Gidimten clan, of which you're a member. Yeah, I think one of the things that we discuss quite often is um, obviously has to do with our traditional governance system and our hereditary chiefs and how even through the uh, potlatch ban where our governance was made illegal and people were jailed for um, participating, um, there was a lot of trauma around that with like, uh, priests coming in and burning regalia in the villages and making examples of people that were still participating. Um, and despite all that, the Wet'suwet'en never stopped participating. They, you know, the potlatches continued um, in secret and the names were continued to be passed on. Um, these are names that have been in existence for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I think that that is such a huge threat to the state that, you know, even after the Delgamu and Gesteway court case in 1997 that you mentioned um, in the Supreme Court of Canada, they recognized that our governance system had never, it was continuous and that we had never given up rights and title to our territory, like the full 22,000 square kilometers of our territory. And so um, because of that, um, so many other nations have been able to use that court case to uh, further their sovereignty. And, okay, that's good. Um, but the uh, provincial and federal government, as well as industry, so like, you know, the Minister of Forestry or, or you know, the, the mines and oil and gas and all of those extractive industries formed a committee the day after that decision was announced in 1997. And their main purpose was to find a way to suppress the really? decision so that they could have full access. Um, there was an article um, put out on uh, the in by the Narwhal um, where they received freedom of information documents, and it was put out in February of 2020. I think it's linked um, on our Instagram bio. Okay. Um, I keep meaning to put it on our website somewhere. <laughs> Been a little busy. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah. And so it's like very clear that there is a threat. There's, we have been acknowledged within their system, um, as have, having never given up our rights and title and they know that and they know that that's like a powerful decision that could stop them from continuing to steal our resources and destroy our territory. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that is definitely one of the defining features of uh, my nation and um traveling we did a nation to nation tour this summer with mm -hmm. some of our hereditary chiefs to some of our allied nations um across so-called canada and you know it's really interesting to see like how all of the different communities um governance systems and traditions and all of those things have been impacted because a lot of our relatives out East have been experiencing colonization a lot longer, like hundreds of years longer than we have. Um, okay. And, and so, yeah, I think that it's really like a lot of places have similar clan systems. 
Um, okay. they've been, they've been impacted in a way that, um, you know, their ceremonies. And it's interesting because I see this even within so-called BC of like different nations where they have, um, really strong connections still to their ceremonies. Um, but not like the governance system, you know what I mean? So some places might have like hereditary chiefs and they might do ceremony and they have their songs and dances, but they don't practice the governance in the same way that they may be used to. Or there's even places that like combine their hereditary system with like the Indian act band chief and council system, or like with us, we have all of our like governance structure intact And we have a a lot of our songs, um, but not so much like the dances or the ceremony pieces. Like that was really kept like so far underground that like, I don't know anybody that practices like our traditional ceremonies anymore. And people that maybe do have knowledge about it, like aren't public, you know what I mean? Um, So it's really, it's been really interesting to like see the the difference of how colonization has impacted different areas across so-called Canada and um, right. all of our relatives that were went and visited it over the summer. But um, wow. I think that the governance structure is definitely like one of the most, um, I can't remember what you called it, prominent features. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm quite ignorant. I'm, I'm learning. Um, uh, so, so you're saying that the 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 invaders didn't reach Western Canada until a long time after they got to Eastern Canada. Is that mm-hmm. yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, they started out east and then made their way west. So, like our Mi'kmaq relatives that are on the east coast have been experiencing, you know, uh, colonization for like they were first you know so well like by like like a hundred years before like by a long time sort of thing oh like hundreds of years oh, okay before. yeah okay i mean we're sort of tucked away up in like the northwestern part of british columbia right so like even our relatives like down south in so-called bc were experiencing contacts like a lot sooner than we were um okay. and then it took a while um because it was you know travel was hard <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, really interesting. Okay. Um, Can you explain to the increasingly international audience, um, some even though I've only got 300 subscribers or whatever, um, something more about the importance of stopping the coastal gas link project, not just because fossil gas is exacerbating the climate crisis. Um, I mean, you've you've already implied it, but... um, I guess perhaps you could focus down a little bit more on the specific destruction of this specific project. Um, And what does that mean? The fact that it's, that it's attempting to trash indigenous sovereignty or sovereignty over the land. um, Maybe you could talk about, you know, is, could that be a dangerous precedent or, well, I don't know about precedent. I mean, they've been doing it for in, you know, for years, but, um sorry that came out a bit confused but i don't know if you can speak to that somehow <laughs> yeah i think um it's all kind of tied together so i think that our rights and title to the land is directly tied to our responsibility to protect it So within our governance structure, each house group, so there's 13 house groups that are split up into five clans. And so I belong to Cassia. And so the territory that Gidim Den Checkpoint is on is uh, called Ludespin. And so that Cassia is responsible for that territory. Our house is directly connected to that territory. And so each house group has specific territories that they're responsible for. And with Zinqua is the boundary between Cassia and Unistodan. And so essentially everybody is responsible for the protection of Wodzinkwa because that water is so pristine and it's so clean that we still drink from it. Like 
I'm not sure if there's anywhere where you live or anywhere where our viewers live where you can like put your cup directly in a waterway and drink from it. I wouldn't risk it, no. Yeah, and most people won't. Like we visited communities um, on our tour this summer where they can't even swim in the rivers and creeks in their territory because it's so poisoned. And so we have a responsibility to protect Wudzinkwa, not just for us and not just for every single human being downstream, um, but it's also our main spawning channel. So that's where all the salmon come up from the Pacific Ocean and spawn is at the headwaters of Wudzinkwa. And so everybody depends on that. So every human, every village, every um, animal, like... You know, there's, I don't know all the science behind it, but I think it's pretty simple um, that, you know, they have found like salmon DNA in trees along the riverbanks, you know, like everything's connected. So if we just, if we kill an entire species of salmon, um, which are spawning right now. So there's people that are um, traveling down uh, Wadzinkwa in like, um, raft boats, you know, like those rafting tour guide kind of outfits. Um, and they're getting footage of thousands and thousands of salmon that are in that specific area where they're tr- drilling under right now, thousands of salmon that are spawning and they have images of like the salmon and the eggs. And so we know that salmon spawning beds are so fragile Like they need a very specific temperature. They need a very specific amount of oxygen. And though the oxygen comes from like little tunnels underneath the riverbed and you can't see with your naked eye where those channels are and you won't know until you've disrupted them and killed (laughs) the, the spawned salmon. And so that process is happening like right now. And right now is when they have started drilling under Wudzinkwa. So we have a huge responsibility and, you know, at times it does feel overwhelming, but um, I guess I signed up for it. (laughs) 